Hi, everyone. Welcome to our third community check-in. Thanks so much for joining us as we are in week nine of social distancing. And, you know, spring is here, even though it snowed last Saturday. Um, but we hope that you're all finding moments of sunshine and peace during this time. And, of course, staying healthy. Um, this is our third community check-in. And I just want to quickly introduce our community team members. So we have Lisa Simmons, who is our Community Initiative Program Manager, Luis Edgardo Coto, he is our wonderful Cultural District Manager, and then we have our Program Officers, Timothy Afam, Ricardo Guillaume, and Veronica Ramirez Martel. And we cover different regions of Massachusetts, as you can see here, and even though we, you know, we are assigned different regions, we are a pretty tight-knit group, and so we share a lot of information. And so thank you to those who have submitted their stories or just, you know, joined any of our office hours and check-ins to share what's going on in your communities. So today, we're going to talk about how arts and culture spark social change, create connections, and enrich civic dialogue. We wanted to present this um, particular topic to open up conversation on why arts and culture are important to ourselves and our communities, especially during this time, and to explore the different ways in which we communicate the value of our work and practice. We obviously as a field, we understand the value of arts and culture, that it's a powerful force for building community, for providing ways to help us understand our commonalities, our differences, and our you know, various layered realities. Um, and we see beyond its beauty as arts and culture help ground us as individuals, which also extends into how we build our communities, how we build community wellness, growth, and reflection. And so we are so excited to um, have our guest speakers join us today to talk more about this topic. And so we have, I wanna welcome Emily Ruddick, who is the executive director of Mass Creative. She's going to talk about, you know, updates on how the budget process is um, taking shape, if it has started. Um, and she's going to share some arts advocacy resources and framing for talking about arts and culture moving forward. And then we have Dr. Diana Alvarez, um, who is an artist and, sorry, and, um, Dr. Diana Alvarez is a singer, songwriter, poet, composer, filmmaker, educator, and scholar whose multimedia performance, Quiero Volver, a Chicanx ritual opera, has been described by the press as a visually and acoustically stunning performance meant to honor women, non-binary, and genderqueer people of color. She's going to talk about, she's going to talk about the opera as well as the Bridge Song Fund an emergency relief fund for Black, Indigenous, POC women, non-binary, and genderqueer artists in Western Mass, as well as her work around utilizing the arts, especially through music, as a way to help people see and understand the interdependent, interconnectedness of individuals, groups, and systems, and to also give voice and visibility to marginalized communities. We also have Carolyn Cole, who is the director of the Downtown Lynn Cultural District, and Tia Cole, who is staff administrator for the Lynn Cultural Council. They're going to share how creative problem solving and cross-sector partnerships led to a new pilot program that addresses food insecurity in the city of Lynn, which has led to reimagining existing systems around food access and distribution. And then we have Chelvania, Chelvania Gabrielle. Chelvania Chelvanaya Gabrielle is an artist, scientist, and facilitator. In September, they will be organizing a show at the Northampton Center for the Arts. It will be a creative resilience project-based installation relevant to our collective and individual COVID-19 trauma and resilience. And so we're going to start with um, you, Emily, and we'll just flow through all the different guest speakers and then towards the end, we're going to share some advocacy and arts and culture framing um, tools that we have at the agency. And then we'll make sure that we leave time for Q&A. 
And um, just some housekeeping. So for those who are online, if you just make sure your mics are muted when you're not talking, and questions can be entered into the chat box, which um, our program staff is managing. Emily. Hi, all. Thank you. Now. I am going to share my screen. We've all become experts, right, at this? Um, so thank you. Thank you, Mina. Thank you to the communities team and Mass Cultural Council for your for the opportunity to chat today. And thank you all for joining us on the call. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of sort of quick government affairs events that have been happening in the last couple of weeks and then turn to a specific uh, advocacy item that you might want to consider doing. So uh, yesterday, yeah, yesterday afternoon, the House released the HEROES Act, which is their draft of a fourth stimulus bill. It is, I'm going to just go really top level here, but there is significant funds for state and local aid. Um, that is really the focus of the bill, as well as there was provisions for $10 million to the NEA and the NEH, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for Humanities. Again, the, the provision was that there would be a 60-40 split. So 60% of the money, the NEA and the NEH would grant directly, and 40% of that $10 million would be distributed to state arts agencies and regional arts agencies for distribution. And then an additional $5 million to IMLS, which is the Institute for Museums and Library Services. Um, so, so sorry, let, let me just say, so that was announced yesterday, and then the Senate has said that they would not pass it. So, um, we are living in real time right now. Um, and so a forced stimulus bill is absolutely necessary. Um, and it's something that Mass Creative and our partners are advocating for, as well as inclusion for um, all of these items. But it is not clear yet if this HEROES Act will be the vehicle in the actual fourth stimulus bill. Um, but I just want to keep you up to date as I am learning things. So then the next piece, so let's talk about state updates. So um, so the state got some bad news, which is the uh, April 20, 2020 tax collection report came in and it is $2.3 billion less than it was in 2019. Part of the reason that is, is because uh, April is tax, is our annual state tax, like income tax collection month, but the state gave everyone an extension on that. So the, um, the payments weren't made, so we're not seeing that in that time, but that does not make up the entirety of that $2.3 billion. So the legislature is really grappling with the fact that there is significantly less money with which to put together a fiscal year 21 budget right for the for the commonwealth there also two days ago governor baker submitted a um, supplemental budget for fiscal year 20 which is basically like hey we still have two months that we got to pay for here how are we going to do that um, so you'll see on this this presentation there's a bullet that says a 112th budget what does that mean it means that they would pass a 112th budget every month um, until they're able to sort of get a better handle and a better, a stronger handle on finances. That's um, really only used in sort of immediate, uh, sorry, I would say in, in like in real moments of, of unknowing about what, fine, what revenues are going to look like. And that's one of the things they're talking about. The other thing is, is that the House Ways and Means was given a July 1st deadline to deliver their version of the budget, of their budget, right? Usually July 1st is when we see the entire budget done for the year. So this is just a reminder we are in um, unprecedented times and our legislature is actually working I think really hard and really quickly to try and figure out how they're going to put together um, the budget which we all count on right for our our cert, you know for governmental services as well as funding for the mass cultural council and mass humanities so this is something that's sort of it's evolving but it's it's not quite there yet and it's something we're monitoring um, as well so let's talk about reopening really quickly. So um, I'm sure many of you saw the announcement two weeks ago that Governor Baker had put together a reopening advisory task force or, or board that was made up of 11 uh, private business leaders um, and some, sorry, excuse me, some, uh, uh, sorry, 
state leaders. So it's co-chaired by Lieutenant Governor Polito and uh, Secretary of Economic Development, Ken Michael Keneally. Um, it does not have any representation from the creative or cultural sector, uh, which is a, a disappointing, but that doesn't mean that we still didn't all collectively advocate to have someone put on that. Um, they have been meeting with various stakeholder groups um, and sectors for the last two weeks. And on May 11th, they put, they released an initial plan and sort of an initial look at how they're um, approaching the reopening of the economy in Massachusetts. Um, the report itself is due on May 18th, which is also the date that Governor Baker had extended closures of non-essential businesses. So what does that look like? Um, so here is the first page of the presentation that was given on May 11th. Um, I'm going to put in the chat box, I hope, uh, after my presentation, a link to the full presentation. But basically, they're going, they're looking at a phased approach, right? And it's really about, it's going to be rooted in data and science. It's going to be rooted in um, how many cases of COVID-19 are there, how many folks are recovering, um, so that we don't open too quickly and we don't um, suffer an out, a, a resurgence or an outbreak. So, so I think, so again, you'll be able to see a link to the full uh, mini presentation that was given on the 11th, but I just wanted to include that. So what is, re so let's talk about reopening because the state's gonna reopen, but municipalities um, and municipality leadership are also gonna make decisions about how they wanna reopen. Um, so for example, in the city of Boston, they're already talking about how are they gonna do permitting for outdoor events? Um, you know, I think we all saw the news that basically uh, the POPs, the, the July 4th POPs has been canceled because that's too large an event with too many people in close proximity. Um, and what we want to make sure and where we think you all as uh, local cultural council leaders and cultural districts leaders could play an important role is making sure that any reopening task forces or um, uh, advisory boards that municipalities are putting together include members of the creative and cultural sector. And what my good news is, is that I'm sure many of you in this room are already going, yeah, I know, I've been tagged or tapped to do that. That is excellent. So we want to make sure that that's happening in every municipality across the Commonwealth. So we've put together a way to share our platform with any um, organizing, local organizing group who wants to do this. So um, you'll see on our platform that you, you know, you can create a local sign on letter asking your leadership to include arts and cultural representatives in any reopening planning. Um, you can then, we'll create it for you on our website, and then you can share that out with your networks. And um, we ask for like three days turnaround, and then we'll package it up and we'll give it to you, and you can share it with your elected officials. So this is, you know, the sign on letter or the petition is a really great way to show elected officials and decision makers that there's um, a large constituency who cares about this issue. So I'll put a link in the chat to that as well. Um, and I hope for some of you that is helpful and you take advantage of it. The other two things that I wanted to just share, or sorry, so that's one of the things I wanted to share as a top advocacy action. The other one is data, data, data. So um, the city of Boston and Mass Creative are actually working on making sure that we are getting more information about individual creative workers and artists and the impact that COVID-19 is ha having to them. Um, and this isn't just for the city of Boston, we're actually doing it for the entire Commonwealth. So um, it's, a, it's a pretty w good survey. It is not overly burdensome and we would ask and encourage um, you to share that with your networks you'll actually be able to find it in this link that's below in the PowerPoint I'll include it in the chat um, but those are two things that you know ha having the data to make our case and make sure that we are advocating collectively for the needs of our community is really important and then also a sign-on letter or a petition is a really great way um, to to do some local organizing and advocate for what you need to local officials. And if you have questions or feedback, I love that. Please, you'll see my email right there on the screen. I'll put it in the chat box. Feel free to drop me a note and say, Em, I don't understand this. Why should I do this? Or can you explain this more to me? Um, I am always open um, to your questions. Or if you're like, Emily, never give this presentation again, tell me why and I'll adjust. So that is all from us. Thanks a lot.
Thanks so much, Emily, for sharing those updates and information. I do have a question for you since we are talking about, you know, how individuals as well as institutions can frame their stories around arts and culture. And I was wondering if you, you have any resources related to, you know, piecing together stories or in terms of, you know, really activating people's, um, you know, feelings and thoughts and imaginations when it comes to drawing upon their experiences to be able to craft their story. Yes, I absolutely do, Mina. So I'm going to share in the link uh, or in the chat box a link to a um, document we put together, which is how to, sh how to share your personal narrative. And this is actually based on incredibly brilliant um, social movement theory. And it really is, is that when you're trying to um, help someone, a decision maker, understand your point of view, you think about, um, you want to make it personal. You want to say, why us, or why me, why us, why now? So you start with, I, you know, I'm Emily Ruddick. I uh, grew up in a, a town that allowed me to access incredibly rich arts education experiences. And through that, I found my voice. I found my people. I found out how to be a leader. Um, and then I found myself in a situation where I was working for a theater and the city wasn't taking into consideration that theater's needs, even though that theater um, was a major service provider and like brought support um, to neighborhoods across the city, um, told the stories of living residents of that city. But when, um, you know, when push came to shove and the, the decision about how, the, how money was gonna be allocated to, to folks in that city was made, that theater lost out. And for me, it was a really galvanizing moment to say like, we all, you know, we need this. Um, and it's really, you know, this is my role. My job is to help advocate um, for the things that we all need uh, as a sector, right? So that's my personal story. Um, there's a worksheet that kind of helps you go through that. Like I was this, then this happened, now I'm this. And that's why I'm asking for, for you to help me with this now. Um, that is a great way to engage with any decision maker. It also, frankly, humanizes the, uh, the issues really quickly. So data is incredibly helpful, but when you're able to match that with the personal story of transformation, it makes a huge difference. So I will put that in the chat box. The other thing is on our website, we have a number of other ways that you can engage um, and tips and tricks. And you know, around COVID-19, there are some specific advocacy work that we're trying to do and stand up. Um, and I wanna just, I'll, I'll include that in the chat box too for you to um, access. Is that helpful, Mina? Great, yes, thank you. So we're going to shift gears a little bit and I'd love to reintroduce um, Dr. Diana Alvarez Thank you for joining us. You and um, Chilvana are, are actually our first two artists that we've had on our community check-in. And so thank you for you know, joining us and also sharing your perspective as an artist, um, the importance and value of your work. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here and to join you in your meeting, your community check-in. Um, is my microphone clear? Are you? Very clear. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> since we're talking about bridging um, personal narratives with our research, um, I am an artist scholar and um, we have an amazing body of work and methodology by women of color artists and scholars where we know that research exists in our flesh. It's called theory of the flesh. Um, this is not a new theory, so it's, um, I wanted to start us off with a grounding, uh, a short song to get us all grounded and present with this, with this knowledge in our bodies. Um, this is a song from my opera called Ser Artista, and it means to be an artist, and there is a translation in the song. Ser artistas dudar. Las maquinaciones de este mundo Ser artista es construir Contradicciones para vivir 
To be an artist is to doubt the machinations of this world. To be an artist is to construct contradictions in order to live. To be an artist is to have a nest of iron in the chest when you don't find your people. To be an artist is to make food out of words, movements of the body, temples of the voice. Your voice, tu voz, is the ultimate poem, poem of being, poema. Para vivir, ser artistas tener un nido de fierro adentro del pecho cuando no hayas tu gente. Ser artistas hacer comida de palabras, movimientos del cuerpo. Templos de la voz, tu voz es el último poema, poema de ser, poema. So. I often like to, oh, thank you. <laughs> it's so nice to see that on Zoom. I see a little one on the screen as well. As well. Yay. Um, I'm going to share um, two slides uh, just to give you a sense of who I am. Okay, so as uh, Nina mentioned, thank you for that beautiful intro. Um, I am a singer, songwriter, composer, poet. I teach music writing and performance. Uh, I teach voice and I make music videos, documentaries, and I'm a scholar. Um, this work is um, multidisciplinary, but it is that way because I seek liberation and transcendence through art as a multi-sensory artist. So that's really, it's really important for me to engage in a multi-sensory experience as an artist. And that's why I created an opera after many years. I, you know, I studied, I did my, I completed my MFA when I was younger, and then I worked in higher ed for many years, and I've been a musician for all of my life. And I was trying to find a way to merge all of these things together. And that's why I have this long list of things that I do is, is I was trying to bridge everything together. Um, and so uh, there are three projects that I'm going to just point you to that, that are my work. Um, I call these gathering spaces. So Quiero Volver a Chica Next Ritual Opera is a multimedia performance altar where the stage is an altar to women, non-binary, and genderqueer artists of color. Um, I created this piece as part of my PhD program in electronic arts at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Um, I was not finding over the course of all of my education in, in, as an undergrad, as a graduate student at elite private liberal arts colleges or at really prestigious research universities, I was not finding artists such as myself. Um, I am a Chicana from Corpus Christi, Texas. I am from a low-income family. I am the first in my family to go to college, let alone pursue and complete a PhD. Um, my language is multilingual. So I was not finding myself anywhere. and. I wanted to create an academic space. I wanted to create um, a multi-sensory space that honored BIPOC women, non-binary, and genderqueer artists of color. So my opera, Quiero Volver a Chica Next Ritual Opera, was the result of about six years of work. You can find uh, more information on my website. It's diana-alvarez.com. And here are some images um, from the opera. So. For this piece, I 
have my own original songs. You just heard one of them, Ser Artista. Um, I usually perform with a guitar. Um, and there was an ensemble script that I created for artists to perform different sonic meditations on themes of motherlessness, loss, grief, building consciousness, and building family. So um, for BIPOC artists, uh, my research and my life living experience just showed me that we are often experiencing multiple traumas, multiple early deaths. Um, we're hit many, many times constantly from a young age moving forward. And um, one of the important things one of the important learnings of this is that first we, we must build chosen family and that is just common especially for queer artists of color um, and it is also important that we um, share resources for how we create community care um, and so a lot of that as Nina mentioned is is very much based on the fact that we're interdependent beings that we are constantly affecting others and, co and others are constantly affecting us and we really can't, we can pretend that we're totally individual, but we're not. Um, so, so you can see uh, here are some of the artists, amazing performers that were part of this piece with me. This is the first time um, I staged it at Holyoke Community College in 2017. And if you click on this here on my website, you can see a, a sample of the opera. Um, in 2018, we performed it at the Academy of Music Theater in Northampton and raised over $10,000 to support immigrant justice. So I will be um, staging this over and over and it's currently also in revision. Um, so, I'm going to go back to my slides here. Um, the next project I want to talk to you about. All right. I have all my, I just taught class too, so I'm like have all my <laughs> tabs open. Um, okay, so th the opera came from my research, um, which is, you know, my dissertation is Bridge Artistex Innovate gatherings of women, non-binary, and genderqueer artists of color. And in this research, I uh, interview four artists, Sharon Bridgeforth, who is based in LA, Magdalena Gomez, who's based in Springfield, Massachusetts, Vic Quesada, who is based in Northampton, Massachusetts, and Nicole M. Young, um, who is based in Connecticut, in Windsor currently. Um, and each of these artists, I created documentary, short documentary portraits of their work. And those portraits are in the opera. So the opera is, as I said, multimedia. So it includes my script for performance, includes my original music and short documentary excerpts of different artists. So the idea is the stage is an altar in the Chicana feminist tradition of building an, a space of attention and of political purpose and the icons on the altar are the artists um, that have been interviewed that I've interviewed um, and this is a continuing project of of continually building an archive of BIPOC artists so that we can um, that we can share resources and tools of healing and community building consciousness um, one important aspect of my research was that we um, in terms of science and medicine, we have so far to go in terms of um, of learning the needs of people of color. That so much of, and these are things that we just know in our communities. We just know we go and talk to abuela, <laughs> talk to auntie, and we'll we'll have an answer here <laughs> for how to survive. But I did this work to document this within academia, to have it in a formal space um, that, you know, we have to create knowledge from within, essentially, and community-based knowledge. And finally, um, the Bridge Song Fund emerged from all of this work 
And I'll just take a moment to pause and say, you know, at some point in my PhD trajectory, I was really trying to understand, well, what is it that I could study for the rest of my life and be totally happy doing? Because I'm going to be doing this thing for a long time. Um, and that was to support and center and honor and cherish BIPOC women, non-binary and genderqueer artists of color. So all of these things come from this desire to bring attention and nourishment to um, a particular group of artists that is vulnerable in society to oppression and systemic and state violence. And also that beyond just saying, oh, we need to bring people to the table, it's actually your table will not be innovative and will not be genius if we are not there. So it's not about like, oh, let's bring more diversity to our world. I've worked in the world of diversity and inclusion for a long time before doing this work. This is about the genius of BIPOC artists of color and innovation and progress for humanity. So in that process, um, as the pandemic was starting it was my birthday and I wrote to Anne Hackler of the Institute for the Musical Arts I said Anne I'm really concerned about artists and our ability to stay afloat I don't you know I, I was feeling it for myself I'm a gigging artist and basically knew that all my gigs for the rest of the year were just starting to just go away um, and so with her help we started the Bridge Song Fund Emergency Relief for BIPOC women, non-binary, and genderqueer artists of color. So we give unrestricted grants of $500 to artists um, to cover medical expenses, to cover food and rent, whatever they need to survive. Because the Institute for the Musical Arts, which is a safe haven for women and girls in music, because they're a small organization, they, they've been able to turn over the grants in a really fast way. Um, so far we have granted 10 artists and we have four more that we will grant this week um, and we are still seeking donations and the applications keep coming in so that's what we've been working on it was just a way to create uh, an injection of nourishment you know like some way to just nourish our community and also um, it's something that we want to continue well beyond our current public health crisis. Um, we'd like to have a sustained fund, an emergency fund for artists of color. Um, this fund specifically is for musicians and music business related professionals because of um, because of their nonprofit status and, and what their, their mission is. Um, so those are three projects that I have been working on and that take up all of my life. <laughs> thank you for listening thank you diana so much for the beautiful performance and your words um it's really incredible when you experience art even through the virtual medium like it really speaks to you and as you mentioned like it does help ground folks and i was wondering um you know like we usually in this space um at the agency, we talk about how to present information and our values around arts and culture in a way that speaks to legislators and also, you know, our municipal officials. Um, but really, like it involves kind of an internal reflection on an individual level. But then, of course, it's tied to all these different um, entities and different groups um, where that interdependency and interconnectedness come in. And I was wondering if you could just talk briefly about how, you know, as you have navigated um, these different spaces, so bridging academia with more like ground level community and activist spaces, um, as well as, you know, speaking to and connecting with individuals, how you found that experience to be um, just as a way to uh, eliminate folks on the bridges that you have been able to develop. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that wonderful question. I think that um, in order to truly advance our 
species on this planet. We need to uh, we need to be able to bridge our knowledge, so our creative knowledge and also our scientific knowledge. So um, that's part of the reason that I create multi-sensory spaces. Um, so I, I, your question makes me think about like how I teach my students to be, uh, you know, like in every class we, um, we speak words of compassion. We end usually with a compassion circle. Um, and I tell my students, this is the most complex work you will do. <laughs> and, and at the same time in class, we are working with research and substantiating our feelings and our positions on different topics. So all this to say that it's really important for us to build the capacity for moving between things. I, I keep saying during the pandemic, just it's hard to remind myself, but sea legs, just remember to move between different worlds easily. Um, so when you're talking about speaking with legislative officials, uh, we've had examples of indigenous community members um, showing us, you know, prayer before before doing this or uh, maintaining your own cultural rituals or um, your own grounding, right? Um, and so there's a, a real balance there. And I think the imbalance that we see in society is when we spend way too much time on one or the other. Like all my feelings should dominate all of this, so therefore you should listen to me. Or um, we're only gonna talk about uh, numbers and data and we're going to ignore any kind of feeling and um, we have a lot of research and a lot of work and it's predominantly done by black indigenous and people of color artists and scholars that tells us that we really need to bridge these these knowledges these intellects that we have so that for me is is how I try to function and work and it's difficult it's super hard and the thing that comes to mind I'm always telling my students uh, like giving them quotes on compassion and love and one is by Prince it's more hard to love than it is to hate right <laughs> like all of this work work of bridging work of love and compassion it's really difficult and it's it's complex um, but we have to take small steps I think and, and try to get there Thank you so much. You're very welcome. So now we're going to have Team Lynn. So Tia Cole from the Lynn Cultural Council and Carolyn Cole, the director of the Downtown Lynn Cultural District, talk about a food pilot program that they launched. You can just call us Team Cole if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> hi everybody, I'm Carolyn Cole. I'm um, the director of the Downtown Lynn Cultural District. I now work under the auspices of community development uh, for the city. Um, I uh, sit on the Public Arts Commission, the Grand Army of the Republic Friends Restoration Group, um, the founder of co-founder of Lynn Main Streets. There's just a, a billion things that I just like to get my hands into. Um, and they all sort of lend to, um, I guess, where I find myself today. Um, I'll do a brief intro on some of the uh, things that I've worked to establish as of late. I'll turn it over to Tia, um, and then and then we'll you know do as we do best here. We just finish each other's sentences. Um, <laughs> so um, I guess I'll start with. Uh, you know, when this happened, um, you know, I, I work with artists in the cultural sector. Um, they were my first concern. Um, it was all about, um, you know, a, a granting program. We had just um, distributed among 10 artists. It was about making sure to be flexible and keep that in place, making sure to support those artists that we had already, you know, um, work or projects or whatever else lined up with. Um, we worked with uh, Metropolitan Area Planning Council to uh, release sort of a regional model through the Inspector General's Office um, of a municipal artist contract for public art. Uh, things were going great, right? Like like everybody can pretty much say, um, you were it had momentum going and, and suddenly it sort of came to a crash. Um, 
And so you get adaptive and you get creative. Um, so from there, I was, um, I was named uh, onto the Vulnerable Populations Task Force for um, the city of Lynn. That would cover everything from uh, depopulating our homeless shelter to feeding our seniors and our most vulnerable, um, uh, providing support um, that we knew was, oh, 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 thank you, Tia. <laughs> Tia's my brains behind the operation. <laughs> um, uh, establishing support, being proactive about that, um, where we thought it might come up um, uh, with, our, with our, again, population. Uh, that quickly turned into a uh, leading the food security task force um, with our Food and Fitness Alliance uh, executive director. Um, there were so many initiatives happening in the city. Everybody wanted to help everybody. And all of a sudden, these human service agencies were turning into food delivery um, uh, as their uh, main uh, area of service. Um, and, and, you know, once you all sort of start tapping the same resources, those resources start to deplete. And was anybody looking into the future of this and, and how that was going to be sustainable? Uh, so that came together. And of course, with my performing arts degree background, I was put in charge of that food task force. Um, from there, uh, you know, I reached out to United Way and I said, okay, listen, you know, I'm used to being sort of the one woman show. I'm the only person working with the uh, cultural district, aside from Carla Sherry, who I'll give a shout out, was my incredible consultant uh, in the downtown. Uh, I I'm used to partnering, collaborating, uh, leveraging for additional assistance and whatnot. And I reached out to uh, United Way and um, I said, listen, I I'm one person who wants to help a population of 100,000. Um, can you help me help them? Um, and I can't say enough about uh, United Way. They quickly, I actually said, well, we thought you'd never ask. <laughs> they, uh, they had our website already established uh, before I even, I even asked. Um, and uh, so the partnering with local uh, agencies, um, I don't want to miss anybody, so I'm going to list them. The Catholic Charities, LEO, Lynn Housing Authority, Neighborhood Development, Mass Coalition for the Homeless through Lynn Community Health Center, Northeast Legal Aid, Children's Law Center, and the New American Center. Um, as you can see, there's sort of been a, there was a quick sort of pivot uh, from um, a main focus on arts to that humanity side of this. Uh, those artists are our residents in our community too. Uh, how can we service a greater good for basic needs? And that's what this, this fund does. Um, it really covers the basic needs of our individuals and residents from uh, rent assistance to food to uh, infant supplies to internet access so the kids you know local uh, public school kids can can continue their education um, all these little things that nobody should have to worry about right now but so many people are um, and it was all again looking at sort of that greater picture okay if we start to solve these solve but uh, assist with these um, you know, individual items, how will that translate into a, a broader, more widespread area of support? Um, and it's about getting creative. Um, and so from there, we went to, uh, again, the mayor's office said, there's an opportunity and, and, and nobody does opportunity like you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a yes woman. And so um, we took on a, a pilot program called Food for Thought, um, where we're working with our, um, local food project uh, to basically it's a it's a service that's multifold right it's gonna it's gonna work with our uh, some of our local restaurants it's going to um, support them by allowing them to bring back some of their staff members for um, providing them with the capability of a delivery service so this this came to be an issue where all the people were sort of tapping the same free food delivery services and food pantries and a large a large portion of those didn't um quite need the free service they had benefits they had their snap benefits and now the pebt and these things were in existence but there was no way to be accessible with those in this time in, in this in this time of you know the unknown they don't even know who to ask um, and, and some of the places, you know, couldn't remain, that couldn't sustain uh, being open at this time. It was all sort of marrying these, these 
multiple issues, right, that are going on. Um, and so how do we look at something like that and say these people have money to spend that can go be going into our economy uh, and going into some of these businesses, like I'll name Ernie's um, Harvest Time in the downtown. Um, they may have, um, you know, cultural needs, dietary restrictions, this and that, but again, they have the money to spend. These restaurants uh, who had been putting out uh, full prepared meals and, and losing money every day, but didn't care because they were doing it for their community. Um, how do we how do we make them each a component in this whole larger initiative? Uh, maybe this one's selling you know produce from uh, the the food project. We're helping the food project buy in for the off season. We're supplementing um, the hip benefits for seniors that don't kick in until July, um, and creating this whole delivery aspect that makes everything accessible because it's about accessibility right now. Um, some, some people have the money to spend, but they're immunocompromised. They're, they're, they cannot leave their home for a number of reasons. And, and we understand that. And, and, and how do we help them? Um, so uh, as it stands now, this project is gaining some, some support. Um, there's been amazing grants out there. I can't say enough about the COVID related project opportunities that are arising and that just flood my inbox every day. And I just you know, want to be able to capitalize on all of them. Um, the, the outreach is, is just phenomenal um, on, a, on a regional level. Um, and we're all just so grateful. Um, so we're looking at um, basically bringing healthy food, this whole food sustainability structure uh, to two, three sites a day um, and bringing it to those who need it most. Um, there's, there's a lot to it. It's new. They gave us about a week and a half to put it together, but, but if you know us Coles, we'll, we'll be putting it together. Um, and the way this, this is really going to unfold is now this falls under the governance of the Food Security Task Force, which legit, legitimizes it in the eyes of the city. It's received a little um, CDBG relief funding to support it in its sustainability initiative. Um, and as we sort of start with these partners that you see on the screen now, um, it's meant to expand into um, an infrastructure that's going to assist with this issue that we all know is going to last well beyond this, this current time. Um, so, so that's where we're at um, with that. And none of that came without, again, partnerships. Uh, collaboration, assistance, um, people just wanting, wanting to do good for their city um, and for each other. Um, with that, I'll switch it to, uh, I'll turn it over to Tia. Um, Tia has been instrumental in not only this, but with the United Way Fund and with our task forces that I drag her into, because well, as my father always said, if you want something done, you ask the busiest person, uh, and that's Tia Cole. Um, so Tia, if you want to elaborate a little more on anything I missed on that, and we'd love to hear about your um, mutual aid, Lynn, um, and then um, maybe the, our maker space and how, you know, being on the ground level with our artist community is really um, taking hold in this time. All right, but I have two young girls in the background playing hide and seek. So I'm just going to throw that out there. And they loved, loved, loved the song. So <laughs> thank you. Um, Carolyn, you're amazing. You always make my head huge. Um, I always say you're the busiest person, but I'll save up all the rest of the gushing for later. Um, <laughs> so the food thing, it, I think Carolyn really kind of hit everything on the head um, where because when we do arts and culture, when we do arts and culture, we, we make connections. Like I know Uncommon Feast because they like have art in their space. Um, we're familiar with Christopher's Cafe because they actually were the first to come and support galleries at Lynn Arts, our first arts association in the city. Like they gave us plates of food for our first fundraiser. Um, Ernie's has always just been a long time staple in downtown and we're downtown continuously. So it's, it's across from city hall. I'll go and visit Carolyn and, you know, brainstorm and then go and grab dinner. So I think that our arts and culture, um, connections are really what we brought to the table. Like Carolyn said, she has a performing arts degree that's leading a food task force. That's because, <laughs> because we know how to scrounge for money <laughs> and we know how to activate people and come up with creative solutions. So when someone came and said, hey, we'll give you some money for this food, pod, food pilot, we said, okay, well, maybe maybe our, our friends over at uh, Essex, um, 
Essex County creates might have like some information or maybe our friend at Mass Development through the Creative Catalyst grant that Lynn Main Street received, maybe he might have some information. So we didn't like reach out to those necessarily normal funders. We reached out to our art people and we said, hey, art, arts and culture people, we need help. <laughs> help us figure this out. And I think that it's been a really good learning process for me. I know Carolyn's always doing all this leveraging funds work, but I'm learning the lingo and <laughs> that's been nice. Um, and, and again, it's really just activating, activating the community. So trying to keep our mutual aid was kind of formed to hold space because people were not receiving good information and everyone was getting scared and people were starting to fight with each other. And that communication piece is being lost. And I think that's another thing as artists, we're able to communicate in a way that can be calming and nurturing um, because we're all creators. So mutual aid was created really to have that space for everybody and to connect everybody. Because again, I think that's another thing that we do as, as creative, uh, as a creative community, is we connect and communicate well. Um, in doing that, um, the Brickyard is is one of the um, one of the nonprofits that started in the last two years. And Lynn, I'm one of the founding board members there. They were able to um, kind of keep our our health center afloat when there was that PPE crisis. They activated makers throughout the entire community, and I think. Um, in total, I think it was over, and I can't see the slide right now, <laughs> but I think it was over 4,000 pieces of um, personal protective equipment was made by people in the, in the city and then distributed out in the city. And some of the cool things about that is, again, connections, creative connections. Someone randomly reached out to us when they, we were trying to figure out like which pattern to use and said, hey, we have N95 mask fabric, but we don't have the means to make it into anything. Do you guys want it? So we got schools of, you know, the proper type of fabric. So we were making actual medical grade type masks for our, for our community health center. Um, they've been amazing, but at the same time, just, I think a conversation is had that is it going to be sustainable to to keep going? Are we going to be able to have the funding to keep going and keep making and and trying to learn how to pivot and and move and connect our resources to everybody? Um, I'm on the board for galleries at Lynn Arts. I mentioned Christopher. I mentioned that Christopher had given us some information. We've been trying to activate people by having um, postcards mailed, and I get to be the recipient of the postcards. So this is an example of some of them. Um, so we have, I got a huge stack in the mail today. So these will all be put together and, and sold as soon as we can all start coming together. Bear with me just a second. Carolyn, do you have something to say? I just tell my kids to be quiet. No, I have sort of an in conclusion when you're all, when you're done. I think that was it. <laughs> our, we are to talk about our cultural council, right? So our cultural council has met together and we um, were able to, under the guidance of Mina, thank, thank you so much, um, to work to support all the artists and people that um, have applied for their cultural council grants but aren't gonna be able to do their programming. Um, and we're kind of helping everyone through it, giving advice. We're going through everything case by case to um, make sure that all our local artists and nonprofits in the community are going to be supported as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Ready for your conclusion. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say this, and it's something you all know. Um, but but I guess from our end, every place is unique, right? Um, we're we're seriously proud learners, um, and everybody sort of has that spirit within them. Um, so if somebody wants to challenge why um, we should be supporting the creative and arts community right now, um, I'd say this. Our area's biggest needs have been met through creative solution. Um, I applaud our city for acknowledging and legitimizing that. Uh, through our creative problem solving, we're covering the costs of basic needs of our most vulnerable residents. Um, we're feeding those individuals and families who can't feed themselves. What? And we're supplying personal protection equipment to first responders in an era when there's a global shortage. So our administration put the survival of our most vulnerable populations in our hands. And if that doesn't express what we're capable of and how much we're needed, I don't know what will.
with that, I'd like to announce my candidacy for president. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, thank you, Team Cole. Thank you to the Downtown Lynn Cultural District and the Lynn Cultural Council. Um, we're, we're at four almost, but we want to continue and extend the conversation. And of course, we have Chelvanaya um, to present. And so um, it sounds like you know, Carolyn and Tia partnerships is really crucial in terms of um, being able to implement creative solutions and have them actually take shape and form in a community. And so we'll see if there are any questions after um, that you can answer. So now, um, Chalvanaya, I'd love to welcome you. Great, thank you. Um, How are you? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, I'm great. I'm okay. Yeah, a little, uh, a little overwhelmed. I had a busy, busy morning with uh, our senior symposium. <laughs> but um, anyway, I, um, <clears throat> I am. Um, I should explain the senior symposium. I my my day job. I'm the lab manager for Hampshire College uh, for the sciences, um, and so our graduates had their their big end of the year symposium and I was sort of uh, hosting that this morning so I'm sort of shifting into this um, but um, aside from that I am uh, also um, as as Mina thank you for introducing me um, I, I I'm also I like I'm sort of shifting how I name what I do because I do so many different things it's kind of hard to put it into one thing um, but uh, you know uh, basically I describe it as a, a multimedia uh, storyteller and a, a resilience facilitator um, that that sort of captures enough of it for for now and then you can talk to me about the rest of it right so um, basically what it is is I, I um, to give you some some background um, my uh, I, I've been creative you know, I've just sort of been been a creative for a while. I, um, I, I when I was when I was from very young, I would write uh, stories and 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 whatnot, and and uh, do origami and 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 other different kinds of things. But it wasn't um, <clears throat> excuse me, it wasn't until right after the last election, if we can call it that, um, uh, that I um, turned to painting. Um, and as a, as a form of creative expression. Um, now, basically what I needed at that time was something that was, um, and I didn't, you know, it wasn't sort of a, uh, I, I didn't have a fully formed thought as to why I turned to painting, but afterwards I, I realized I needed a nonverbal, uh, a way of, of, of sort of integrating all of that I was going through at that moment, all that we, that a lot of, all of us were sort of processing in that moment. Um, and I, uh, uh, you know, a way to heal, a way to, you know, to, to, uh, to focus some of those energies, if you will. Um, and, uh, and something that got me out of sort of a judgment space, uh, um, a mindset, if you will. Um, so, you know, the writing wasn't, wasn't doing that for me at that time. Um, so I, so I, you know, I, I'm a self-taught uh, visual artist, so there, there was no preconceived notion as to what was the right thing to do, thankfully. Um, and I, I basically uh, found a, a set of canvases and paints in the attic and I, I said, you know what, I'm just gonna play with this. And my rule is I have to do something, I can do anything, but I have to do something once a day. Uh, and so starting in November, uh, or so I, I actually stuck with that for, you know, for quite a while, which is saying something because I have ADHD and, and a bunch of other sort of neurodiversities in this brain of mine. So uh, um, <laughs> anyway, to, to sort of make a long story short, um, at first it was for me, okay? It was for, for my own sort of needs and, and healing and whatnot. But um, once I started, once pe other people started to see my work, um, it, it, you know, and started to respond to my work, it became very clear that this, this story of, uh, of using creative expression 
to um, as a form of healing and plus using healing and creative expression together as a form of activism in this moment uh, in a political mo moment um, really resonated with people in a in a very uh, you know a very strong way um, and not just you know oh I like this but I could see that it was like an embodied sort of response right I mean there was just there was something within people that was clearly being activated and I thought okay well I have to keep doing this clearly um, and so so you know that was sort of the beginnings of my um, you know turning this into something more than just simply making paintings. Um, um, and so my first uh, solo exhibit in Amherst uh, at the Burnett Gallery, um, what I did was I created an interactive exhibit um, that <clears throat> took my, my works, or certain, certain pieces of my work, to tell the story that I just told you. <clears throat> um, through the works and through some text and through and through the way that I set it up and the fact that I didn't put the titles up and let people come up with their own sort of ideas before they found out what the titles of the pieces were um, and uh, created an interactive component to it um, so that uh, the, the 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 folks who came to the exhibit could answer two questions um, <clears throat> one was what is your conception of wellness and then the other was what you know what are your uh, methods of self-care you know what, what do you turn to for self-care and so asking those questions in the context of you know there were all these little post-it notes throughout the space um, and asking so I was asking those questions with the context of you know uh, look at the different pieces in the exhibit and use these post-it notes you know with you know the number of the piece that 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 uh, you know inspired you to write a little note on the board um, connected both the visual sort of response, you know the communication that uh, that I as an artist and and, and the viewer uh, are having in that moment um, with the you know the actual verbal question of. Uh, 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 of what what does wellness mean okay so so that was the and that was the very beginnings of um, of this creative resilience project that I'm now working on which is a, a larger multi multimodal and there's a lot of different ways that it sort of is it be emerging in the world um, way of sort of connecting uh, wellness and identity and and art um, and one of the ways that I one of one of the modes <laughs> of of creating this um, creative resilience project is um, I I am also a, an intergroup dialogue facilitator, and um, so intergroup dialogue is basically a, it's a like a it's a social justice framework for doing dialogue uh, dialogues across difference, and um, so using that model I created a, a workshop or a dialogue I should say. Um, that allowed participants to talk about wellness and identity, but using it, but, but beginning with creating an art piece. So you create your own little art piece. You don't have to be an art, you don't have to consider yourself an artist. It's just, you're just making a little art piece for five minutes. You have no more than five minutes, you know, and, um, and, uh, and then, you know, in, in a group, uh, first, in, first in a pair share and then in a, a larger group, uh, we discuss uh, the, the art pieces and you, you discuss your experiences and conception of wellness, your own, um, within the context of this art piece that you made that answered that question. And then you just, you know, and then you talk about each other's and what the similarities are and et cetera. And then we get into the bigger group and then we, we, we broaden that discussion out to a larger discussion about communal wellness, right? So you start talking about individual wellness. What does it mean for, for me? But then you broaden that out, you know, as you're talking to each other about what, what are the similarities and the differences. And then you broaden that out to talking about, um, 
communal wellness uh, and what what <laughs> in the, in the context of what, what is it that we need right and how can we get those needs met okay and there's so you know obviously be, I'm laughing because you know this this is this is being created and evolving obviously long before this uh this moment that we're in now so it's it's not it's it's a it's just rather surreal is, is kind of why i'm laughing um so so yeah so so obviously in, in my in mind i'm like well yeah i have to i had just have to keep going uh with this project because it's so much even it seems even more relevant and even more necessary um because obviously now we're in you know a, a a, a, a mindset, a mode of of of, um, of taking care, right? Taking care of each other, taking care of the most vulnerable, right? Um, and uh, and that is very very important. But that being said, uh, and that's going to continue. That's that's not going to ever stop. Um, but uh, that being said, there's going to come a time when, it, and and it is it is starting it's already now uh we're you know kind of doing it now but uh where we can begin to think about um you know w when things start to reopen for example um and we well we, we can begin to think about what what how do we want to be you know reconnecting uh, in, you know, in 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 the physical space, and and what are the what are the uh, the ways in which you know we can uh, use this moment to build some new things, right? Leave some of the old things behind, you know, and uh, and build new things that that are serving us better, uh, based on the things that weren't serving us that have obviously been highlighted rather. Uh, rather uh, rather well if you will um so so that's kind of where i'm at i mean i'm sort of using these interactive art moments installations exhibits interventions whatever um i can come up with really to talk about wellness in general to talk about chronic pain uh in, invisible disabilities mental health these are sort of i did you know Con concepts I identities that that are are personal to me uh important to me uh but but um so so th this is all relevant uh to myself um and but but you know in in these uh but but also um also identity right so there's there's also uh, ways in which I I talk I communicate I talk about queerness I talk about trans I talk uh, identity I talk I talk you know other I have so many different identities in this one physical form <laughs> and um, and depending on what space I'm in or what story I'm trying to tell um, or, or where I'm at in my own sort of journey um, those stories will come up and I'll I'll sort of play on them uh depending on what what's going on so and and right now in this moment i'm really looking for collaboration opportunities and uh so i just want to give a shout out to diana my uh my my collaborator there and to nicole who i think is on this call um who i haven't collaborated with yet but i really want to and i'm also grateful to her for my being here uh and um so yeah i I mean, I can kind of leave it there, except to just wrap it up and say that this notion that self care can be, you know, that creative expression can be a form of self care, and that using creative expression as a form of self care is a form of activism. We don't necessarily need to be hitting the streets and doing the, you know, all the, you know, the, what what one normally sort of thinks of when you use the word activism. Um, it is you know I mean, it's the audrey lord uh concept right you know survival it you know self-care survival you know and 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 the concept of self as not just one person but one person in the context of everybody right we have to take care of each other but i gotta take care of me in order to do that 
So. Thank you. Thank you, Naya. Yeah, of course. And I also want to give a shout out to Nicole Young, who is a poet um, and who works a lot in the Western Mass area for connecting me to both Diana and Naya. So thank you, Nicole. And um, I want to mention, I want to introduce Katie Swabak, who's with us today. She's the program officer for the creative youth development team here at the Mass Cultural Council, and she has been overseeing the development of the Culture RX program. And so, you know, Kita, I know you had a couple of questions and I'd love for you to kind of jump in here as we, um, as we think of these thematic ties between, you know, community and wellness and how creative thinking and creative practices can contribute to um, reimagining what those mean. Yeah, thank you so much. I so appreciate the inspiration here. And it reminds me of, um, there's this word in, in Japanese called jabun, which means basically it's not just me as a self that's separated from everybody else, but self in relation. So my share of the shared life space. And that's where I feel like, um, man, you know, if we can leave some of these horrible things behind and create something new, that'd be awesome. So that was sort of my question. I took some notes um, just real quick. You know, Diana, you talked about, you know, to be an artist is to make food out of words. That's such a beautiful imagery. And I think that this multi-sensory journey where you're able to bridge science, art, compassion, spirit, um, I mean, that is what it's about. It is this bridge building. And so my question, I had kind of two main questions. Um, really, you know, what do you see as the opportunity challenge in this pandemic with issues of equity, racial, and environmental injustices as they start to glare even stronger right now, or many people before maybe that hadn't seen them as much are now really seeing them strongly. You know, what, what can we do sort of next? That was my first question and related to that, um, you know, just do any of you have any suggestions on how we can all become, uh, in your words, uh, the multimedia storytellers and resilience facilitators? I love that. But how can we all become a bit more of that for greater advocacy and bridge building um, in these times ahead? So any ideas? I don't know. Uh, who are we? <laughs> well, were you I mean, asking just, questions to me, Antonia, or to everybody? I was just yeah. Wondering. I mean, I just sort of saw, there seemed to be a theme a bit of you know bridge building, of you know really being able to say yes. You know, the arts are oftentimes the first that gets cut, but at the same time, we know that it is the connective tissue that really keeps us all of our spirits alive and able to really um, just charge forth a bit more. And so, I guess. My, my fear is in all of these budget cuts, such that Emily referenced um, in the times ahead, you know, what do you see, you know, in terms of campaigns that we might do, in terms of just ways that we might become stronger in our connective tissue, um, you know, across sectors, even with science, art, and government, um, sort of in these next steps ahead. Any, practical or ideas and moving I mean forward. I can throw a few things out if 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 you want um so obviously I mean some of the things that have been happening of course are are uh mutual aid groups are popping popping up right um cuz you know it, yeah you got to do what you got to do right and so we might as well take care of each other as best we can um within you know certain pockets and and I think that that is the sort of thing that uh you know, art artists and you know, can jump. You know, basically, the more we can make things visible, the more we can highlight and you know just 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 make it more and more visible. And that's kind of what we do, right? I mean, that's that's you know that's that's. I mean, so I, I mean that anything like that, um, just you know, raising the volume, raising the 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 sort of the you know uh, of 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 systems that are different than what they had been of ways of doing things that aren't what was um, and whether that means you know signs songs 
uh, <laughs> I'm looking at you, Diane, even though you don't know I'm looking at you. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, performances that are related to, to, to these things. I mean, it could be anything, but the point is, is to just keep saying the same things over and over again in different ways because different people are going to hear it, right? And, you know, the, the one thing that is becoming more and more clear is that you have to, we have to keep saying these things in different ways because, you know, you might hear, uh, you might be suddenly on board because it, it got, you know, there's a story that is personal to you because there's somebody in your family or there's a friend of yours that is, you know, somehow connected in with, you know, I don't know, whatever it is. They're, they're a member of a vulnerable community. They, they, they've been talking to you about climate change. You know, I don't know. The point is, is that we have to make things personal for people. Uh, and the way, the way that looks is, is so different for everybody. I mean, I'm beginning to, you know, it sounds obvious, but it's just beginning to hit me. And I guess it's hitting me so, you know, so like in, in the moment because I, uh, I just had a you know a conversation with my neighbor recently, and I'm realizing, wow, he he hasn't really gotten the whole this the the, the nature of the pandemic and what it means to uh, take care of people and why you need to do that um, because it hasn't affected him yet, mm -hmm. uh, and and that that when I realized that that hit me really hard. But it, it didn't hit me hard because of him. It hit me hard because he was a representative of everybody else on the planet that's like that, right? And I'm like, well, what do we do, you know? And I was talking to my mom, and I'm like, we got to do something about this. And, you know, it, other people need to be doing something. And, and, and basically, it comes down to communication, right? More needs to be communicated because this guy clearly doesn't, isn't getting the the urgency of what's going on and whose fault is that i no, I, not, no, I don't know the answer to that question it doesn't matter the point is is somehow we got to we got to get through we got to get through it and uh and but but that includes finding ways to decrease the stress decrease the ways in which we get so you know, hyped up that we can't, we can't actually connect. We can't actually see the solutions, you know? I mean, all of these things have to happen and they have to happen together, um, you know, because there's, we need everybody. And, you know, how we get everybody on board, you know, it, it, it's gonna look different for everybody. So that's kind of where I'm at. Great, thank you. Yeah, of course. I also had just put in the chat too, I just wanted to mention um, in terms of cross-sector partnerships and you're talking about health and well-being, there's some amazing work coming out of Florida and um, across the country around uh, creating healthy communities, really yeah. having bridging that interaction of public health and the arts. So I put one of the links there and then um, I'll just throw in another link too for the white paper. Cool. So since you're sharing links, Keita, I actually want to just share some other resources that folks might find useful. Um, so here are some advocacy resources. And so um, we have our Power of Culture core principles here at the Mass Cultural Council. And you can find these principles also in our case statement, um, which has a lot of different um, statistics, as well as a lot of language and direct quotes from folks that speak to the values of how culture embraces everyone, how culture enriches our communities, culture drives growth and opportunity, and culture empowers a new generation. And so um, I know that our program officers have been putting various links in the chat, and so all of them will be there. And then I just Stop the share, but I want to go back. And then also keep in mind that we here at the Mass Cultural Council, we can 
um, draw up different investment reports so that you can see which agency programs have um, directed money into your communities. We can look at local cultural council grant histories along with any grant that we have at the agency um, in case you need that to support um, any sort of case thinking. And then Mass Creative, um, I know Emily are going to share a bunch of other links, um, but they also have a policy and advocacy platform. Um, Americans for the Arts, they also have an advocacy toolkit. And um, I wanted to also share these links from Art Place America. And I think, Keita, actually the one from Florida that you shared is affiliated with some of the work that Art Place is doing. But they have a lot of great articles um, that talk about the intersectionality of arts and creativity. And so tying it to transportation, how it's um, you know, re redesigned certain agricultural systems, health, how it's you know, led to certain different um, tenants, tenant rights activist movements. Um, so those are some links to check out if you're interested in learning more. And then as always, we have our COVID-19 resources that we update um, every, every week, I think. <laughs> um, so you can find them here as well. And so I just wanted to share those. Um, but going back to Kate's question, I just wanted to see if, you know, um, Tia, Carolyn, or Diana, you had anything else you wanted to add to the conversation? at this moment. I'll say just to chime in that and to underscore that I think the work is about attention building. Um, I was just teaching a class on transformative justice to my students today and just introducing them to this framework and um, it goes it's counter intuitive or maybe it is intuitive but it's counter to the capitalist structure that we exist in right to go slow and to, for processes to be complex and take a long time. Um, but I think that for real transformation to occur, we really need to slow down um, and maybe use the slowness of this current time to our advantage to, to give attention to the people that we have not done justice to. Um, and so I think that's where uh, to answer your questions about like how do it sounded like you were essentially asking like how do we do better <laughs> and all you know moving forward and that, that's what it feels like to me it's about building attention um in whatever way that you can um and to not lose sight of the creative aspects of your work the artistic aspects you know it was very intentional for me to come to a meeting today and to say i'm gonna start with the song because I w it's very important for me to remember and to share with others that we are, you know, we exist in this flesh, our body exists, uh, or our brain exists in a body, but, you know, like, we often forget that we are human beings, you know, <laughs> like, we're just running constantly. Um, and um, so in whatever way you can do that, uh, I know it's, it's I guess it's I speaking to the complexity of it. It's difficult, and it's moment by moment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we will be sending out notes from the meeting to those who attended, and we'll also have a recording of the session available on our YouTube channel, which we'll also share. And then. Um, and then on, in your, on your chat box, there are three ellipses. And if you click on that, you can save all the content that's in the chat for those who want to save and you know, preserve that file. And again, I just want to thank our speakers, Emily, Tia, Carolyn, Diana, and Naya for joining us. This was a very beautiful session. Thank you so much for bringing yourselves here in an intentional way, and we hope to continue the conversation with everyone.